we're on the same When I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. I'm about the past, I'm about the future. Welcome back to Draft Vice. We're back, we're here, we're doing it again and again and again. But guess what? It's it's over. It's over. This is the last episode of all, not last episode of Draft Vice, but the last episode of the draft, right? Our last recap, the Green Bay Packers and the Denver Broncos. Uh, a team that had maybe one of the most, I think, uh, debated about drafts as far as Green Bay goes, and a team that had maybe one of maybe one of the best drafts in in the league in Denver. So, I mean, we'll kick it right off with the with Green Bay. Uh, first round, they were picking, you know, at pick thirty, and they decided to trade up with Minnesota. It was Minnesota. No, uh, was it Minnesota? Seattle. They traded up. They traded their fourth round pick. And they go ahead and they select Jordan Love, right? Uh, quarterback out of Utah, big, strong, athletic quarterback. Um, you know, played much better in 2018 than he did in 2019. There was, you know, there was a coaching cha- uh, changeover, some talent changed over as well. Kind of a similar story to Josh Allen, but also a similar story to Deshaun Kaiser and a couple of other guys who have been hit or miss in the NFL draft. So. This was kind of a big thing to a lot of people because they're going like, you know, a similar thing happened with Aaron Rodgers when he came in with Brett Favre, you know, came in, Brett Favre was there, stayed there for two more years. Uh, you know, the big difference I think a lot of people have been making, I don't think this really holds much water, is, uh, oh, well, they traded up. They traded a first round. You know, I, I think I understand that the big argument was that Aaron was expected to go number one overall in that draft. That one makes more sense. That was a bigger I think like Aaron was almost going to be the number one overall pick, and he fell to to the the end of the first. I think if you you know that made sense, and even if Green Bay had traded up to grab him as a falling quarterback, nobody had Jordan Love as the number one quarterback or the number one player in this draft. So I get that being like the differentiator here. I uh, I, I get why people are a little. M- weird about this right you have Aaron Rodgers you have this elite quarterback who's played really well the thing he's wanted is a, is a new toy he wants a new receiver he wants new weapons he wants he wanted somebody who like me you know they haven't spent a first round pick on a receiver in in a long time as a skill position player in a long time you know the last receiver they drafted really high was Devontae Adams he was in the second round that was almost six years ago now so and then there was Eddie Lacy, who was a running back, who was drafted relatively high. Speaking of which, they dropped a running back in the second round this year as well. Uh, we'll get to him later. So he, you know, I think a lot of people are thinking like, you got Aaron Rodgers, you got him on the, you know, you're towards the end of his career. You just missed the the championship. You either got to go ahead and get somebody to help stop the run, which I really don't think there was anybody there who was going to contribute to their run defense. So I really don't hate on them for that portion of it. I know some people were like, well, what if they had trade up and got Patrick Queen as a linebacker? And I'm like, you know, I think Patrick Queen's a good linebacker. I think he's going to be fine. But I don't think he was making their defense exponentially better. I think he's, you know, I think that he would have, he would have definitely made their defense somewhat better eventually. Uh, I've mentioned it before. Linebacker's a little weird in the transition department. You know, we saw guys who were top 10 picks have a harder time translating as far as linebackers go. And then we've seen guys in the third round end up being very good. Uh, it's just one of those more volatile positions. It's scheme fit. It's uh, can you digest the playbook and can you get used to NFL speed? And can and does your speed translate? I think Patrick Queen will be good. But again, like that, I don't think that was the differentiator between them having a top five defense and a bottom five defense. As far as receiver goes, I listen, if they had drafted a guy like Michael Pittman or uh, T. Higgins or even K.J. Hamler or traded down and took a receiver, absolutely, I would have been all on board with that. That's how I would have done this draft. I, I'm kind of more of the belief of uh, you can wait. I, I think we are in the, the, the times now where quarterback is just not as uh, – like there seems to be plenty of quarterbacks. If you get one on a good deal, it's great. But there's some question marks with how his contract works out with you know Aaron Rodgers. You still have a couple more years with him. And it's going to end up being a cap hit, in, unless you tra- you know up until twenty twenty one. In which case, there's still going to be a heavy cap hit, but it's not as bad. So you're talking about at least maybe two, three years more with Aaron Rodgers, who's again still probably one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, and probably one of the best to have ever played the game. And you still have only gone to one Super Bowl with this guy. 
and you had an opportunity to take a really good player, a guy like uh, you know Michael Pittman, who can be a contributor right away, a guy like T. Higgins, who you could probably get something out of him if you utilize him correctly, uh, K.J. Hamler, add some speed on that offense. So I, I, I was a little bit shocked by this as well. I... I, 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 but here, okay, so let's back it up, right? I get the pros, though, to drafting Jordan Love, right? You saw what happened with Pat Mahomes. You, uh, you see what's uh, gone on with guys who've gotten to sit for a little bit, who had a, a veteran presence. You know, you had it in your own town, right? You had it happen multiple times. This is a, this is a team that has never had a quarterback drought. Now, in, in almost like 20, 30 years, they have not had a quarterback drought. They're, they've gone, they've gone two generations of quarterback. And just pass the torch right along. Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers. Now they're hoping Jordan Love. I I think to them Jordan Love was a top fifteen player in their book. He was the last guy on their their first round pick board. Like you notice, a lot of teams don't have a true for like their first round picks or they don't have thirty first round picks on their board. They have like ten to fifteen. And then there's a lot of guys who are second rounders. And then they go, well, these guys are all kind of grouped together. We'll trade down. We'll do this. Uh. I, Aaron Rodgers, I mean, I, uh, Jordan Love to them was a top 15 player on their board. And when he fell to where they were comfortable trading up to and they didn't feel like a fourth rounder was going to cost them a lot and they it was going to be, okay, we could trade up and get some, uh, get a, a good player um, and, and a guy who we think will set us for the future for a time where maybe, you know, we saw it last year, right? We saw Andrew Luck walk out and retire. We've uh, we've seen guys get injured. We've seen guys leave. We've seen guys get, retire early. Injuries happen. So I get the concept of what they're doing here. Uh, they you know they, again they mentioned his athletic you know his good size. Uh, he's raw. He's really good. Um, they mentioned all the stuff about the coaching staff. Um, and, and they didn't feel like they were one player away. Right? They felt like listen, we got we went thirteen and three. Right, we're not one player away from thirteen and three again. We're not one player away from the Super Bowl. We were, we were a schematic or a, you know or a, a a finishing of the game kind of deal. So they felt like they were a lot closer than everybody else is looking at them at. Right. I I feel mixed on it again. I feel like you've got the best quarterback in the NFL. You have a chance to surround him with a great weapon with great weapons. I think you just kind of got to follow through. But. This was a choice they made. They're setting up their team for the future. I get why it is very why everybody's kind of like I can't believe they did this, and I agree with that too. But listen, there's other ways to build your team than just through the draft. Uh, they did sign Devin Funches. They they have guys who have been on their team for a few years now, right? Equinemius St. Brown, Alan Lazard, uh, uh, MVS, uh, Marquise Valdez Scantling. And again, they have Devontae Adams, so he's still there. And we're going to talk about their roster in a little bit, so we're not going to harp on it too much right now. But I again, like the people who are going, oh my God, the sky is falling, doesn't mean you're not able to to adjust your roster somewhere else down the line. We saw guys get traded, like Marquise Goodwin. Um, we, we see, we'll see guys get released and guys get cut and guys get traded still, again, going into the year. So it doesn't mean they can't build up the receiving core. Yes, they didn't spend a first round pick on a receiver. I, you know what? Absolutely true. But chicken little, the sky ain't falling. You still got Aaron Rodgers. Um, I actually think I'd be a little bit more worried about the offensive line, uh, just because you don't know what you're going to get with uh, Rick Wagner and a couple of the other guys you have on the O line. But I, it's still a good O line. But we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. So Jordan Love. The, the biggest, I think, biggest surprise, not the biggest surprise, I think the biggest surprise was Jalen Hurts in the second round of this draft, but um, one of the bigger surprises in this draft, trading up, taking him. So let's talk about their second round pick. A.J. Dillon, running back out of uh, out of Boston College. Uh, he's a big man, a lot of speed, a lot of straight line speed. He's a downhill runner, but he kind of has that thing of like kind of, you know, they they were a big fan of him, right? They, you know, you look at his, his measurables, right? Six feet. 247 ran a five a four five three. Uh, they want to use him as like a downhill pound it kind of Derrick Henry esque kind of running back. Um, I think his problem like the things that people kind of see on tape that they're a little bit worried about are the same things that people complained about Derrick Henry for is that the, he's not really truly always playing to his size and that he's not utilizing that 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 
that power to their ability. But uh, very much, like, as far as measurables go, almost exact comp to Derrick Henry. I, it, but, again, they you know, they, he doesn't utilize a lot in the pass-catching game. They said they felt okay with that. They felt like the, between the combine and their meetings with him, they were able to get an idea how they can utilize him in the passing game, how he translates. So, uh, again, I, they said he was underutilized. They feel like he could utilize, he could be used in that capacity as well. And, again, he's a big guy with a lot of speed. I I was very skeptical of this pick as well. I was personally, again, I felt like if you, okay, fine, you know what? I, I felt like they should have went the eagle route where, say, you know what, yeah, you took Jordan Love, but you better spend every chance of your the rest of your draft trying to go ahead and get you know some weapons around Aaron Rodgers because you don't know how much longer you got him for. And I guess that's kind of their counterpoint to it. My thing is, is you know, we see, you know, we see James Winston out on the, the street. We we seen Cam Newton out on the street. We will see other guys available who you don't ever know down the line. Like that's why this, I, I kind of like the Saints method. We're not really worrying about it right now. We're just making everybody think that we've played to that game. Regardless, uh, AJ Dillon uh, kind of is like the it can be kind of what they had when they had Eddie Lacy, right? This big, bruising back, very athletic, very a very good speed. Uh, I I I don't have my notes on him. I should have pulled those up. But he was a uh, when I watched him, I I didn't feel like this was a guy who I was really eager to go grab compared to some of the other players that have, were in this draft. Uh, but if they utilize him correctly, they feel like they can get something out of him. Like I said, uh, running back is a position that translates relatively well from college to the NFL. So if you feel like you've got a star in a guy. Uh, you know, you're not really super questionable as vision, which I, I, I again, if you feel like you could utilize him, uh, I, I understand it. Uh, my big problem is, is that I feel like this was a position where they, they, they had mentioned, uh, I think in some, uh, some interviews, this wasn't actually the interviews that I, I this is something I had read. It wasn't something I had watched in the interviews that I watched. It, there was a, a mention that they did try to trade up, but they couldn't trade up without sacrificing picks next year to which I said, well, that was your mistake. You traded away a fourth rounder, which would have been the thing to help you get up in the draft where you were in the second round. You could have let Jordan Love fall, but apparently they didn't feel comfortable with the guys who would have been there at 30. I I, I, I get it. We're not going to keep harping about the Jordan Love pick. I felt like, again, I feel like a lot of people were not huge fans about it. I have come around to it a bit. I feel like there are ways that they can build around Aaron Rodgers still, like I said before. And this is another aspect of building around Aaron Rodgers, right? You're not going to keep both Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones, you kind of want to utilize more of his receiving ability, right? He was so good as a pass catcher, as a as a weapon, and they were able to utilize two running backs really well. So one of those guys is walking next year. You're not paying both of them, and they really like having two really good running backs who are versatile, who can you know utilize you know their ability to get out in space. So I think they would want to utilize having Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon at the same time. So and there's even been talks right now about an extension with Aaron Jones. So I even I, I kind of don't mind this pick. Uh, yeah, and I guess you can utilize. I guess their their theory is Aaron Jones is kind of a quasi receiver for them at this point, plus a running back. He's just an all around good weapon for them. So now you got those two guys, and then they go offensive again in the third round, right? Which is weird because I think a lot of people were confused because they thought they were gonna go more defense. I think when you look at the defense in this draft, like the defensive players that were in this draft. There wasn't a lot there that suited their needs, right? They, you know, they have corners and they have some pretty good ones, and they can probably they probably expect a little bit more development out of the guys they have there. Um, I don't think anybody was really hoping they would take corners, defensive tackles they could probably take, but like you know, guys who were good run stoppers probably went a little bit later than you know than where they were taking AJ Dillon or even where they took. Uh, um, the next pick, which is Josiah Degara, who's kind of more of an H back kind of guy, like a uh, Delaney Walker, early stage Delaney Walker. They like him. They think he's versatile. They could utilize him by having him line up on the line of scrimmage in the backfield, have him uh, kind of uh, and utilize him all over. The, you know, again, H back, get him to block, get him to kind of get some good mismatches, and try to get some run after catch with him. And 
you know, I know there was some talk about maybe him being kind of the Kyle Juszczyk. Just he's another piece. He's another weapon. They have, you know, you get a guy like him, you know, uh, get him out in space to block. They were kind of talking about. They're like, listen, we he might not be a great guy on the line of scrimmage as an inline blocker. He can do that a little bit, but he doesn't really have the size for it. What we're going to utilize him for is maybe get him out in space and get him to block. So again, they run a lot of outside zone. Now you have him more as a fullback, get him up there and kind of he's kind of like a quasi fullback H back tight end. So. Uh, they met him at the Senior Bowl. They really liked him. They liked the way they can utilize him. Uh, he's more receiver than blocker, they said. But again, that 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 versatility of being able to block and be able to block really well in space is going to help get your running backs to be able to break free even further. And that's really the plan there. They're utilizing the the hey, we want to break you know massive yardage. We want a guy who's going to kind of give him a mismatch. If they go ahead and stick a linebacker on him, he's going to get separation. We could throw it to him. If it's going to be a corner, well, guess what, man? He's going to bully some of these guys out, and we can run the ball. So. Uh, I thought that was a good pick. I think a lot of people actually like the, you know, I know some people are like, well, fullback, they're going to utilize him as a fullback, so isn't that kind of high to take a fullback? And it is, but uh, if you're looking at him as strictly a fullback and not an offensive weapon, like, again, you know, Kyle Juszczyk, we saw Kyle Juszczyk get, like, one of the biggest uh, salaries for a fullback a few years ago for the 49ers, and he has been a chess piece for Kyle Shanahan. So this is very much the same thing. We saw, you know, another guy... uh, you know, the Patriots used to use uh, Mr. Hernandez kind of in a similar way. And I think that's kind of what they're going for. They're going not for, you know, the murder and everything. Besides the murder, they're looking, they're not looking for murderers. They're looking for guys who can go ahead and get off the line of scrimmage and go ahead and block and get be a mismatch weapon. That's what they want to utilize. That's kind of part of the Kyle Shanahan tree of guys. They're the, this outside zone, play action, get, you know, some schematic mismatches with your players and be able to utilize guys that you can scheme open at, by utilizing those mismatches. So day one and day two, again, I think uh, there was a lot of controversy about the Green Bay Packers day one and day two picks, right? Running back in the second round, quarterback in the first round. I, and actually taking running back in the second round is not that big of a deal. I think people have been overblowing the, you know, taking running backs early. Like, I remember the rule used to be don't take a running back in the first round. Now you're not allowed to take a running back in the second round, really? How many, how how, how long does this rule go on? You're not allowed to take running backs at all in the draft? That's kind of stupid. Uh, it is. It is very stupid. You can't be so completely like we're just flat out not doing this kind of deal. There, there is something to be to gain be gained from some of these players. Now they might not, you know. Again, let's move on. So day three comes along. They no longer have a fourth round pick, so they're not picking till the fifth round. They take Kamal Martin, six three, two forty, played a lot at Minnesota. Excellent size and length, can run. Uh, dealt with injury. It's probably why they got him where he was, but he's healthier now. And when you look at his 2018 tape, he's another one of those guys who played better in 2018 than 2019. That seems to be this this kind of trend for the Green Bay Packers is that they're going for guys who did better in 2018. They felt like 2019 was a mulligan. Not every guy, but like one or two guys. Uh, then you go ahead. They drafted a couple of offensive linemen. John Runyon out of Michigan, left tackle at Michigan. Uh, you know, uh, interior offensive lineman, uh, Jake Hansen out of Oregon. He's going to be kind of more center guard flexibility. Uh, and and uh, they also took Jonathan Garvin at the end. He fell because of injury. They felt like he actually could have went higher. Uh, this is a team that, listen, they their, their offensive line is aging out, and a lot of the guys that they've had on their O-line were late-round picks. So, again, as you continue to draft and develop, you lost Bulaga, you, you come in, you, re, you, know, you sign Wagner in free agency, and you're hoping he's going to compete for that right tackle spot. Uh, it, it, they're looking to go ahead and and try to churn the roster and get some young guys who can be, you know, depth pieces and then hopefully develop into true starters. So looking at this team, again, you got Aaron Rodgers, you got Aaron Jones, you got Aaron and Aaron and Jamal, right, out of the backfield. Jordan Love's not doing anything this year. Don't worry about it. I don't think they're pulling him out and doing all the the Lamar Jackson stuff that they were running uh, down in Baltimore when Lamar Jackson was sitting behind Joe Flacco. Uh, wide receiving core, Alan Lazard's coming back, Devin Funch just got signed, Devontae Adams, the star receiver of this team, Marquise Valdez-Scanling, James Kumaro, uh, uh, Equinemia St. Brown, who we really didn't see last year because he had an injury, uh, 
I, I believe uh, Jay Sternberger's coming back. He's coming off of injury as well, but they feel really you know good about him. Uh, Josiah DeGara's coming in. You know, remember they let go of uh, Jimmy Graham. They still have Mercedes Lewis. They brought him back. Uh, running back room is pretty deep here. And then you look at their their uh, their O line, right? Eggleton Jen- Elgin- Elgleton Jenkins. Uh, David Bakhtiari, Corey Lindsley, right? Those guys are all coming back from last year. Billy Turner, guy who they signed last year in free agency, uh, he's returning at right guard. Rick Wagner is plugged in right now for right tackle. But, again, you have Alex Light. You've got Lane Taylor, who, again, really hasn't played super well, but has been a good back. has been an okay and a solid backup. Um, you know, has played uh, uh, when Bulaga and Bakhtiari couldn't play. Uh, so you're going to have a competition for right tackle. And you're hoping that one of these guys steps up. But offensively, they got most of the same guys back, right? So they should be good offensively. It's going to be year two in this offense. They're going to be able to pull up and, say, like, start adding in the little bit of wrinkles that you get when you're year two, year three into an offense, right? The stuff we're seeing from Kyle Shanahan now, right? He's got that thing established for three or four years. That's why, you know, that offense was scary because that defense was scary. That defense was scary because that offense was scary. It was it was kind of a good mix and match. They were able to be potent because everybody had been there for three or four years. Now you're on year two in Green Bay. This is going to be a good offense. I You know, I, I, I know the FPI power rankings came out and they had Green Bay very low. I think they're underrating Green Bay. So, Look at the defense, you know, Kenny Clark still there, Dean Lowry, uh, uh, Tyler uh, Lancaster, Preston Smith, Zedaria Smith, uh, Christian Kirksey's now the linebacker there as well. Uh, I believe they still have that, uh, the, 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 the guy who they drafted early last year with one of their first round picks, uh, Rashawn Gary. They, they have, Zedar- I mentioned Zedaria Smith, they have uh, Oren Burks. So, again, they lost uh, Blake Martinez and B.J. Goodson in free agency. They decided to bring in Christian Kirksey. And the reason why they went right after Christian Kirksey and Rick Wagner in free agency made sense. These guys won't count towards the comp pick formula. You're going to get a couple of extra picks next year because you lost Rick Wagner and Blake Martinez, and they signed big contracts. So they're probably going to get a third or a fourth out of those guys, maybe bowl, maybe a third and a fourth, depending on how, how much they play and how long their contract is and how much they got paid. So, defensively, again, it's a lot of the same guys are coming back. Zadarius and Preston, uh, Lowry, Kenny Clark, Rashawn Gary needs to take that step forward, right? Big athletic kind of defensive end. Um, I think he's going to, you know, I want to see how they utilize Rashawn Gary in year two. Um, Christian Kirksey, I think he can rebound and be a solid linebacker for him. Used to be a, uh, a Cleveland Brown linebacker. They released him, and he came over here. Uh, to Green Bay, uh, the back end is what really makes this defense, right? Uh, Jazir Alexander, uh, Jair Alexander, Adrian Amos, Darnell Savage, Kevin King, Josh Jackson. Uh, they spent a lot of picks on corner and safety and, and money on corner and safety. And, they, uh, well, uh, at safety anyway with Adrian Amos. But, again, they have a, a very good back end, right? Their, their defensive backs are good. It's not necessarily really deep. Uh, Josh Jackson and Kevin King uh, are kind of the, the the level of the depth, and a couple of other guys are there. Will Redmond can, is coming back as far as being some of their safety depth for maybe some of their lick, nickel looks. So uh, overall, this roster's still good. They still have all the pieces that made them a very solid to good defense last year. Oh, and actually, in the beginning, they were way more than solid. They were they were just destroying teams. They were really good at the beginning of the year. Their defense was holding everybody down while their offense learned to take that step forward. Then everybody started learning the offense, and the defense started taking naps. So it's kind of how it goes. So now you're hoping, hey, the defense is all healthy and going to be together. The offense is going to be you know more in tune. I think this is a team that's going to be back in the playoffs. I do. I think it's a little, you know, I do not think they're going to take a total step back. I think it would be ridiculous because you still have the greatest of all time, Aaron Rodgers. Like, again, one of the greatest, of course. Um, so there you go. I, again, I think their division kind of leaves it open for them, right? Uh, you have whatever's going on in Chicago. You got Minnesota's kind of churning their roster. I think they're kind of they're going to have a, a, what's it called, a gap year, if you will. Like, they're going to go ahead and go take a trip to Germany and meet a nice little French girl and hook up with her and get some herpes, come back, and uh, 
And then they'll come back next year and they'll be like, they'll teach you all the new things that they learned when, you know, from their exchange trip. Anyway, uh, what was I talking about here? Uh, Minnesota, yeah, might have some uh, exchange trip issues. And then the Lions is the one team in that division I think is going to be a bit of a wild card because we've seen that roster turnover multiple times. Uh, a lot of assistance change over. I honestly think Green Bay is going to, like, I don't know how Minnesota got, you know, the FPI rankings. I don't know how they're considered a higher than Green Bay. I, I'm looking at this and I'm going, this is Green Bay's division all the way. Now, granted, if Chicago can have a functioning offense and a solid defense, like, again, their, their defense returns to what it was a couple years ago, and it very much can because it was good last year. It was good all the way up to a certain point last year. And then, again, guys, you know, you, you wear out. You're, you're not on the field long enough. You're not able to sustain drives. So if they can get some kind of production out of Nick Foles and Mitch Trubisky, uh, I think that the if if Chicago's offense is moderately okay and their defense is what it was a couple years ago, it's going to be a good situation down in Chicago. But that's the only team there that I think really scares. Now, again, like I said before, the Lions are kind of the the sleeper team there. Chicago, they got to get their shit together. But Green Bay is the only one that I look at in that division and go, Everything that they had that was good last year is coming back this year. So I think they're the kings of that division. Uh, they're going to probably make the playoffs this year. Uh, again, it was it was an intriguingly weird, uh, but a, a controversial draft. It was a very controversial draft. But nonetheless, let's move on, right? We don't need to talk about all that controversy no more. It was a good one. Again, you know, free agency. Like uh, we already talked about that. Yeah, we're we're back. We're moving on from that. So let's talk about the Broncos, right? Cousin Ricky's favorite team. He's been on the pod before. Uh, you know, again, Denver Broncos, I think I like their draft. Maybe one of the, the best of all time. Maybe not the best of all time. But let's, let's go over their free agency, their pre-draft process, because we haven't gone over the Broncos uh, since uh, we, when our Looking Forward episode came out. Like, we've talked about their moves uh, it, through free agency and everything and trades but we really, when last time we did the Looking Forward episode, it was before free agency. It was one of the, the first teams we did in Looking Forward. So uh, they traded for A.J. Boye. They traded for Jarrell Casey. They tagged Justin Simmons. They declined Bulls' fifth-year option. Yeah, I know that wasn't before the draft, but I thought I'd throw it in here right now. To uh, They signed Shelby Harris. They re-signed him, got him to a one-year deal. Um, they signed Melvin Gordon. They signed Graham Glasgow. They let Chris Harris walk. They let Connor McGovern walk. They let Will Parks walk. They all go to other teams. Uh, Parks goes to the Eagles. Harris goes to the Chargers. Connor McGovern goes to the Jets. Uh, interesting free agency, right? Like, uh, you know, you kind of uh, you replace a lot of pieces. Got a little bit younger, actually. I feel like because AJ Boye is still kind of relatively young. Um, not, not young, young, but he's kind of in that mid range for age for corner, like for a guy you want to get a free agency. I know there were actually, um, funny enough when we did do the, the looking forward episode, right? We were talking about their potential picks in free agency. And one of the, the things we were talking about is them going after a corner. We were thinking Byron Jones. And then if you guys follow the Broncos, you might know a guy named Benjamin Albright who tweeted out at the time that the uh, he's a, he's one of the best beat reporters for the Broncos. Uh, so if you want to be high on Broncos stuff, go follow Albright. He usually has some good information, not just on the Broncos, but on other teams as well. And he had tweeted out at the time that they were very much in on Byron Jones. Then they trade for A.J. Boye. And, but the thing was, before all that happened, we said that that's the kind of guy they want, that Byron Jones would be the sleeper candidate for, like, they would be a good candidate for Byron Jones. It kind of came off the whim for them, but it was perfect for what Vic Fangio does. A.J. Boye, same thing. Very scheme versatile kind of guy, can play zone, can play, uh, can play man. I, I, you know, I think he fits that scheme very well. Uh, again, very good corner to grab, and they trade a fourth rounder for him. And they had it. They had extra fourth rounders anyway because they did that whole trade with Emmanuel Sanders. So uh, I, I think that was a good move on their end. Getting AJ Boye, they trade for Jarrell Casey for a seventh round pick. They picked up a thirteen million dollar contract, whatever his was. That's going to be a nice, you know, defensive line depth kind of guy. He's going to add to having, uh, you know, you already have, you know, you have Bradley Chubb coming back off of an ACL tear. You have, uh, of course, you know. Uh, Von Miller coming back, you know now, but he's kind of in the later stages. So now you're building up around that defense of having 
you know, you have Von Miller at outside linebacker, you have Bradley Chubb, you got Jarrell Casey pushing from the inside. You have a three point you have three points of very good pressure on that on that defensive line. Assuming Bradley Chubb comes back at full form, kind of hard to expect coming off of an ACL tear, but I do believe he tore it relatively early, so you know, he might come back and be relatively full health. So uh they decline you know, I talk about Bowles fifth year option uh in the fifth year option episode, but I thought I just you know, I'd drop it here as well for context and it's just they, they have not been happy with his performance, gets a lot of flags, likes to hold a lot, and uh he thinks he's better than he is sometimes. Uh Sheldon uh, Shelby Harris, that was a guy who actually probably thought we're gonna leave was gonna leave, didn't have a strong market, seemed to be a big thing with D tackles this year. Seems to be a big thing with D tackles every year. But he didn't have a strong market, so he came back for a one-year, $2.5 million deal. Melvin Gordon was one of the big signings in free agency, which I kind of like because you're getting a guy who's kind of who, who's a good runner, who can pa- catch out of the backfield, and I, I think they can utilize him in, you know, g- good running out of the shotgun, can also run, you know, uh, which you know Shermer tends to utilize a lot of, could also run, you know, obviously while the quarterback's under center. So he, kinda, he has very good scheme versatility. Uh, I love watching Melvin Gordon. He was one of my favorite fantasy players. I've had him on every, I think the last three years, I had him on all my teams. I think last year was the only year I didn't have him on because he had the, the holdout. But the other two years before that, had him on my teams. Made me get to the playoffs both of those years. One of my favorite players in fantasy. Uh, I'm intrigued to see him on this uh, offense with uh, Drew Locke. And that's the thing. They're building around Drew Locke here, right? Uh, with their team, with what they did in free agency, with what they what they do in the draft. And then they signed Graham Glasgow, which if you see this, I'm going to point this out later on as well, as the guys you know who they put around on this team, they got some big, strong movers. They're moving to a power run uh, offense, not doing that outside zone stuff, a little bit more gap power kind of guys when you look at the guys that they signed. I say that, and then I, I hear. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about uh, it, maybe another center they were drafting in this draft that might sell a different uh, direction on this. Anyway, let's go get into their draft. Right, they fired uh, Alex Van Pelt, and they get Pat Shermer. Who we're going to see his offense. He, he he seems to be a better offensive coordinator than a coach, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, round one, right? Round one, pick fifteen. They draft Jerry Judy out of Alabama. One of the best route runners in this draft, probably the best route runner in this draft, um, and he was number one on their board. Like they said, this was our number one guy who we were going to draft. We like Jerry Judy so so much, and guess what? Ended up being there for him at fifteen. They didn't have to trade up um, because you know Oakland was the only other team that took a receiver before them, and they took Henry Ruggs. So they basically had one and two right up there with them. Uh. They, uh, you know, they love his route running ability. I love his route running ability. Uh, they met him in Indy, like his mentality, how he wants to attack the game of football. Uh, they did try to trade back into the first round, so that was interesting. They were trying to get back in, um, because uh, they, you know, they were trying to go after maybe a guy who was falling, who they still had as a first round pick. Uh, they didn't disclose who they were trying to trade up for. Of course, they wouldn't. Uh, but the guy, you know, again, so Jerry Judy. You know, they're building around Drew Locke, right? You're going to a guy who's going to pull some coverage away from Cortland Sutton, who's going to help make some mismatch issues, right? You know, Jerry Judy's a good uh, route runner, good run after catch guy. Uh, you're going to utilize him kind of, you know, he could play uh, slot and flanker. You know, Cortland Sutton's really going to play the X on that team. But you can actually move them around as well. And, again, they're both very versatile, uh, you know, uh, players. And then second round, they go ahead and get K.J. Hamler, Wide receiver out of Penn State. And this is a fast guy, and they love the speed. They love his elusiveness. He's got deep field speed, but he's also, you know, pretty solid route runner as well. He's hard to cover one on one. Now you got three guys that are hard to cover one on one. We're going to make mismatches all over the field. Uh, you know, he's not just a fast, quick speed guy, though. They like him because he can get open in the intermediate areas of the field. Uh, you know, they, they knew how explosive he was as a target and he's, he's a good, you know, does a good job route running. So again, like they, they wanted this guy to, to add to that explosiveness of their receiving court. They got a real true speed threat in KJ Hamler. They got a legit route runner who can get separation anywhere on the field. And then they got the, you know, Cortland Sutton, who's kind of like a Demarius Thomas, but like kind of quicker kind of guy very like a athletic freak very good uh you know very good movement skills has developed really well as a receiver for him now you have three guys for drew lock to throw to not including the tight end that you draft in this draft and the tight end you drafted last year who's played pretty well Noah Fant. so uh 
They did say that when they got to the second round, they really didn't have any more first round grades. That means that they're, you know, nobody who they really, really liked fell out of that first round area. There was probably somebody who fell to the end of the first round and then got picked like in those like last two or three picks that they just didn't get to grab. Sometimes that's just how it goes. Um, round three comes along. They draft Michael Ojemudie. Uh, show the you know they liked his tackling. They liked his uh, ability to play uh, corner. Uh, they think that he's versatile. Can play the slot, outside corner. Can play even a little bit of safety if they want to. But he's going to primarily play corner for him. And uh, again, very good tackler. They you know almost like he's like he they they said he loved tackling. Vic Fangio was bragging on this guy. He's like, dude, this guy is interested in tackling. He went to school for tackling. He actually took a, he has a minor in tackling. He's that interested in it. And that's what you like to see in your corners. Again, especially because Vic Fangio plays a lot of uh, zone. That that's a thing that you like in your corners is them being able to tackle. Because again, some you're sometimes letting up a little bit of uh, you're letting up the catch to to try to reduce the yardage. So, uh, you know, good instinct, very versatile, uh, has good innate football intelligence and high football IQ. That's exactly what uh, Vic Fangio wants in his corners. Again, like that's what you want in his own corners, good good football IQ. But again, they're not going to just run zone all the time. They're going to utilize them in man coverage as well. But I think, you know, again, Vic Fangio runs a little bit more to the, to the zone element, if you will, percentages-wise. Um. Round three, they also had two other guys they took, Lloyd Cushenberry, center. And this is what I was talking about, right? They, they go ahead and they draft this. Uh, I think he was kind of a little bit out of his element when he was doing it, when he was at LSU, right? They were, they were running a lot more of the um, Sean McVay style offense, the Zach Taylor style offense with Joe Brady. And uh, strangely enough, I feel like Lloyd Cushenberry fits a more power run scheme. And again, like he probably had... Uh, like a better 2018 than he did 2019 because that's kind of not the scheme that he was really built for. He is more for gap power run. The strange thing is, right, there was a story that got released that there, and I mentioned this before on the Jets podcast, was they uh, they originally had a deal with the Jets to trade up to get uh, Matt Hennessy, who the Falcons eventually took, uh, uh, center, uh, I don't have the, do I have it on? I do have it on here. Um, I don't have where his school was though. Shoot, can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, they were they wanted to take Matt Hennessy. They were in trade up with the Jets. Unfortunately, uh, Falcons beat him to it. Um, so they they miss out on that guy, which is weird because Matt Hennessy and Lloyd Cushenberry are not exactly the exact same type of center. Uh, I, if I was going more of a zone movement scheme, I'd kind of want Hennessy. And if I'm looking for a guy who's going to be you know, more of in a gap power blocking scheme, I'd want Lloyd Cushenberry. They're not. Then it's not like they can't like play either one. Uh, it's just that's kind of how they've been built and how you know kind of how I've seen them play as far as what I, I think that they are do they will do better as when you look at their athletic profiles. Um. You know, he was a tar- but Cushion Cushionberry was definitely a target for him. They definitely wanted to get another interior offensive lineman. You know, they looked at his versatility, he could play center or guard. Uh the physical demand is gonna be tough in the NFL. They mentioned like he's gonna have to learn a little bit more from a scheme standpoint. It's not just gonna be like what they were doing at LSU. Um Vic Vangio sounded a little bit harsher on this guy, and it kind of makes sense when you hear the story about them actually being in on Matt Hennessy. Um they also drafted uh Mc uh D Lyman McTelvin Asian Azim. Uh, I, they were attracted to his athleticism, his quickness off the foot, you know, off the ball. He's good at getting the passer, and they were saying like you can teach run stuffing. It's really hard to teach pass rush. It's hard to get a guy to be a better pass rusher. You can get them to be a better run uh, run stuffer and get him to hold up to double teams a little bit more. He'd not hold up to him very well in college, but you can maybe teach that a little bit more. Get him a little, you know, get him into strength training. There uh, maybe some technique, and again, you could utilize that in some way or form. Uh, round four, they drafted Albert Okawaguinam uh, out of Missouri, a uh, guy who has played with Drew Locke and, in fact, had a better year in 2018 uh, with Drew Locke. Again, another guy we're talking about had better 2018 than 2019. Um, he, you know, when he played with Drew, But this is one because he, cause his quarterback, who happens to be their quarterback, uh, played with them, and he played really well when he was there. So uh, Okwebenam was the guy who kind of blew up the combine, Albert O. Um, uh, he ran a, a 4.49 at 258 pounds. Pretty nice to see a tight end who can do that. 
but he really didn't play to that speed. A lot of people said, but again, you want to kind of see what he's going to be uh, be able to do with now you get his quarterback back, right? Like again, like a lot of these guys, you see a drop off because you know the new quarterback maybe just isn't getting the ball to them, not chem- not good chemistry. Uh, but you now have a tight end who you can now you can run you know, two tight end sets. You have Alberto on one side and then Noah Fant on the other side. And or even just, you know, you line up on one side again, like you could utilize them all over the line of scrimmage and you're creating mismatch issues. You can run a four wide set with those guys and that's a lot of speed no matter what. So, uh, you know, uh, they uh, Drew gave him his seal of approval. They went ahead and asked Drew. Drew was like, definitely do it. I like that guy. We were good friends. They signed him. They drafted him in the fourth round. Um, and then a couple of other guys, they went, they got a linebacker, Justin Sternard out of Wake Forest. They're, they're going to throw him into the mix to compete at linebacker. They also took Natani Mutai, guy who fell because of injury. They said they had a third round grade on him. Clearly though, like there was some risk of taking him in the third round because he has the injury issues, has two Achilles. He has a Liz Frank. He's never, he's never really been fully healthy for a full season. Um, but again, a lot of teams really liked him. They liked him. Um, and they felt like in the sixth round, the risk was worth the value there. Uh, and again, he kind of fits the style that they're going with when you look at Cushenberry, when you look at Glasgow, when you look at, you know, Natani Mutai, you know, the guys who they're sticking on that offensive line, they're much, you know, they're kind of built more for power. Um, and, and, you know, trying to double team and run some, you know, run some gap power scheme to what they're kind of lean more in the power area of their runs. Not that they're not going to run outside zone or inside zone, but that they, they seem they're going to be leaning more towards that as far as their scheme goes. Um, Tyree Cleveland out of Florida was also another guy. They drafted in the seventh round. Again, they went more for receiver, and then they went edge uh, Derek Tuzika, who's going to be more of a depth piece guy who you're going to have come in and compete for camp. Um, you know, they feel comfortable with their their cornerback room. Uh, the, yeah, they could have attacked it a little bit more, they said. They, they have A.J. Boye. They have Ojemudier. Um, they also have Boswell and Callahan and a few other guys that, that you're hoping are going to take a step back. Callahan, you're hoping is going to come back from injury and play well. Um, you know, they add a lot of speed on the offensive side of the ball. There was talks of going after tackle as well, but there just wasn't one in the area of where they were drafting. And, you know, again, like when you can't get the value of that pick, it's not a good idea to reach when you can go ahead and take a good player at a position that you could utilize and maybe can, you know, build upon a strength like we saw with the receivers, right? They Now, now they're probably their best strength, at least, you know, in, in theory is receiver because you look at that receiving core and it's going to be really good where that was kind of a need coming into this draft for them. Um, so again, you got Drew Locke, he, you know, he played decent down the stretch. I think that they are kind of banking on this being, you know, Hey, listen, this is the all or nothing kind of thing, because you want to make sure that's what the reason why they're building around Drew Locke is not strictly because they believe in Drew Locke. I think, right. There is that aspect of it. You saw him play pretty well at the end of the year. Um, I think there's more to it than that. I think it's, you need to know. You need to know if you give this guy everything that he can play with, you give him all the value in the world that he's going to be able to compete. Um, another thing I wanted to mention before I get into the the the, the roster is that uh, there was mention of the Trent Williams trade. They didn't feel comfortable with the compensation that they have to give up to go ahead and take him, uh, at least the rumored compensation. Apparently they didn't really make too much of an effort calling on it. So I, I think that might have been a mistake on Elway's part because now when you hear about the compensation, was it really all that much? Um, but yeah, you got Drew Locke, you got Melvin Gordon, you got Philip Lindsay, you got Royce Freeman in the in the back area. Jeff Driscoll's there as well. He played pretty well for the Lions um, in spot start duty. Uh, Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler. Um, there's a, uh, Deshaun Hamilton. Sounds like he might be on the way out over there. Uh, and then you know you look at their tight ends. You got you know Noah Fant, Nick Vanette. Uh, Jeff Howerman, and then you have Albert, Albert Okawebenam. So a bunch of, you know, a, a bunch of intriguing, you know, prospects. You know, Vanette and uh, Howerman are going to be more of the, you know, rotational guys. And then you look at their O line. You got Garrett Bowles, Dal- Dalton Reisner, Graham Glasgow, Lloyd Cushenberry, Jawan James. Jawan James was injured a lot last year. Garrett Bowles, you got to learn how to play tackle in the NFL at NFL level for you to keep your job. Um, Dalton Reisner actually. Might be. I honestly would maybe take a look at Dalton Reiser potentially kicking out a tackle eventually. He, ha, you know, he could probably do it. I think more people were looking at him at a right tackle. He, you know, 
or again, some people were looking at him strictly as a guard last year when he came out. He's played well for him. I like, you know, Dalton Reisner, Cushenberry, and Grant Glen- Glasgow gives you a nice beefy interior. And then you got the the, the the nice little patties on the outside with Bowles and Juwan James. Uh, hopefully having those guys there makes Bowles better. Maybe Bowles will continue to develop. Uh, Juwan James, if he stays healthy, I think they're going to be in a better situation. Mike Munchak is their O-line coach. He's a uh, very well-known, kind of high-level offensive line coach. Everybody knows him. He's been able to take guys who were sixth-round picks and turn them into stars. So maybe they still have a little bit of belief that they could get it out of Garrett Bowles. Um, Yeah, so defensively, right, they got uh, Mike Purcell at nose, Jarrell Casey, Shelby Harris, Von Miller, uh, Bradley Chubb. Uh, Demarcus Walker's still there. They have Kyle Kyle Pecco. They've got a, a Jeremiah Tachu. They've got a lot of pieces in that defense. That front seven is kind of scary right now. Um, linebackers, they got uh, Todd Davis, Alexander Johnson. Uh, you know, and then when you look at the back end, it's AJ Boye, Justin Simmons, who they franchise tagged. Uh, uh, Kareem Jackson's going to be playing uh, in there as well. They got Isaac Yadam, uh, Bryce Callahan, Duke Dawson. So a lot of guys they've, they've drafted in recent years. So they bet, you know, you're, you're looking at them to maybe develop and play well. And then you also, you know, draft Ojemudie. So hopefully out of the guys that they have in that room, they get some development out of some guys. You know, we all know AJ Boye is going to probably play well. See, you know, that one ends locked up. Uh, you know, Callahan, if he comes back and he's healthy, he could probably pr- play pretty well. And then I feel like in that mixture of corners that they, you know, between all the ones that they've drafted over the years, Isaac Yadam and and uh, and Ojemudie, I think they will figure out how to lock down that other side. So overall, I think this is a great defense. This might be a, a high-level, very good defense for them. And I, I think that's going to be the crux of it, right? If they can get production out of Drew Locke, and confirm that he is the guy who they want for their future, and if they can go ahead and you know get this defense to play to what the talent level looks like, they're going to be a scary defense. This is going to be like a few years ago where they made it to the Super Bowl in just the defense. You got to realize they also are coming up to the end of like the the years of Von Miller. I think right, like Von Miller's getting up there in the years. You know, even if they want to keep him, he's going to probably want a contract. You know, to be extended a little bit. Um. Bradley Chubb, you know, they probably want to see something out of him this year because next year they have to make the deal on his fifth-year option. Uh, and, and, again, this defense, kind of intriguing. A very, very high-end defense. Offensively, we talked about it before. I'm, I, I want to see what Pat Shermer does with Drew Locke because I've not seen a quarterback of Drew Locke's profile with Pat Shermer. It seems like that was kind of... Uh, 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 an interesting thing because you know Drew Locke was in the draft last year and Pat Shermer was coach of the Giants and there were rumors last year that Pat Shermer really liked Drew Locke and then they took Daniel Jones who you know not the strongest arm in the book so I kind of want to see what this profile does with Pat Shermer at the helm and how Pat Shermer utilizes these guys because again and by the way, whoever's playing slot receiver, KJ Hamler, if you're playing the slot, you're going to get a lot of production in this this offense. So, um, and Jerry Judy as well. I, I think this is going to be maybe one of the more productive receiving cores, provided if, if Drew Locke plays very well. Again, this is kind of like the uh, the Josh Allen thing. They surround him with weapons. The only difference is a couple of these guys are drafted, right? These are all kind of rookie rookie deal guys. So, uh, a lot of cheap contracts. That's that's good. But uh, you're you're hoping that they are productive right away, and that's expecting a lot from a lot of rookies, especially with uh, uh with the COVID off season, if you will. So uh, if you want, you can follow the podcast at Draft on Twitter at Draft underscore football on Instagram. You could follow me at B R O J O. Death is in the end of life. Punch like a delicious drink that you drink in the summer. And uh, again, like like follow, subscribe, rate and review. I'm gonna do a call a shout out episode this week. Um, for all the people who've commented, we've had a lot of good comments. We've had, you know, and I, I appreciate that. We had one on the 49ers video. We had one on the Titans video. I like that you guys have been doing that. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to screenshot those. I'm going to put them up in the episode. And I'm going to do a call-out episode, all right? That's going to be Friday's show. I wasn't expecting to do that. It might not. Uh, and then uh, we'll go ahead and I'll appreciate the fact that you guys have been paying attention, watching. And then it'll be next week by the time this is all over. So 
it was great. It was a great draft. It was a great year. And now we get to look forward to 2020 and COVID's off season, and uh, and then 2021 draft eventually. But not not right now. We're going to talk about fantasy soon, right? I'm going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about the rookies and all the beautiful players that uh, you know. And then you know how I think some of this is all going to fall out. I want to talk a little bit. Maybe by that time we'll talk a little bit about Jamal Adams. Uh, actually, that might be that might also be this week. We'll we'll, we'll see. Anyway, uh, have a good week. Have a good night. Good night, good night, good night. Or good day, because it's probably still day. You might be losing this during the day. I woke up this morning, I was feeling pretty dangerous. I'm about to pass, I'm about to pee.